Hey. Okay. Uh, we're thrilled to have uh, Secretary Mayorkas uh, join us here today. He's going to be making some brief comments, providing you an update, and uh, we'll take as many questions uh, as we can. I would just be mindful of your colleagues so we can get around to as many as possible. With that, I'll turn it over to Secretary Mayorkas. Thank you very much, Jen. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Less than one week ago, uh, there were approximately 15,000 migrants in Del Rio, Texas, the great majority of whom were Haitian nationals. This was the result of an unprecedented movement of a very large number of people traveling to a single point of the border within a matter of a few days. We responded with a surge of resources to address the humanitarian needs of the individuals, many of whom include families with young children. We also applied our months-long standard operating procedures at the border, which we have been applying to all migrants encountered at the border during this very challenging time of the COVID-19 pandemic. As of this morning, there are no longer any migrants in the camp underneath the Del Rio International Bridge. I will walk through what we have done, how we have done it, explain the processes, and provide data that you have requested. But first, I, I want to make uh, one important point. In the midst of meeting these challenges, we, our entire nation, saw horrifying images that do not reflect who we are, who we aspire to be, or the integrity and values of our truly heroic personnel in the Department of Homeland Security. The investigation into what occurred has not yet concluded. We know that those images painfully conjured up the worst elements of our nation's ongoing battle against systemic racism. We have been swift and thorough in our response. First, we immediately contacted the Office of Inspector General and launched an investigation into the events that were captured in the disturbing images of horse patrol units. We ceased the use of horse patrol units in the area. The agents involved in these incidents have been assigned to administrative duties and are not interacting with migrants while the investigation is ongoing. I directed the personnel from the CBP Office of Professional Responsibility to be on site in Del Rio full time to ensure adherence to the policies, training, and values of our department. The highest levels of the CBP Office of Professional Responsibility are leading the investigation, which will conclude quickly. The results of the investigation I will make public. The actions that are taken as a, are as a result of the, uh, what we have seen in those images, the investigation uh, will be compelled, the results will be compelled by the facts that are adduced and nothing less. Let me be clear, the department does not tolerate any mistreatment of any migrant and will not tolerate any violation of its values, principles, and ethics. Now, I would like to turn to our operational response. DHS led the mobilization of a whole-of-government response to address the challenging situation in Del Rio. DHS immediately worked to address the acute humanitarian needs of the migrants themselves by partnering with federal and non-governmental agencies and entities. We rapidly deployed basic services like drinking water, food, clothing, and portable toilets. I am grateful to the Red Cross for providing more than 17,000 hygiene kits in the World Central Kitchen for contributing more than 14,000 meals per day to supplement other food programs. We searched medical resources and capacity, including over 150 medical professionals, to provide health services to ensure the safety of the migrants, employees, and the surrounding community. We provided personal protective equipment, including face masks. We erected four climate control tents to support housing for vulnerable populations. Let me go through our operational response. Simultaneously with the humanitarian re response, we in the Department of Homeland Security implemented a series of operational measures to process migrants consistent 
with existing laws, policies, and procedures. In particular, CBP, Customs and Border Protection, searched 600 agents, officers, and DHS volunteer force personnel to the Del Rio sector to provide op operational support. We also, uh, DHS officers and agents, conducted 24-hour patrols for general safety as well as to identify anyone who might be in medical distress. ICE, the U.S. Coast Guard, the Department of Defense, and the Department of Justice provided transportation support to transfer migrants out of Del Rio to other Border Patrol sectors with capacity. Working with the Departments of State um, in Haiti, DHS increased the number of removal flights to Haiti commensurate with the country's capacity to receive. Importantly, USAID has established a $5.5 million program to, to provide on-the-ground assistance to repatriated Haitian migrants. Nearly 30,000 migrants have been encountered at Del Rio since September 9th, with the highest number at one time reaching approximately 15,000. Today, we have no migrants remaining in the camp under the International Bridge. Migrants continue to be expelled un under the CDC's Title 42 authority. Title 42 is a public health authority and not an immigration policy. And it is important to note that Title 42 is applicable and has been applicable to all irregular migration during this pandemic. It is not specific to Haitian nationals or the current situation. Some more data. To date, DHS has conducted 17 expulsion flights to Haiti with approximately 2,000 individuals. Those who are not expelled under Title 42 are placed in immigration removal proceedings. Let me take a step back and explain the process. There are two exceptions to the applicability of Title 42, the Public Health Authority. Number one is if an individual has an acute uh, uh, vulnerability, such as an urgent medical care, and two, um, if in fact our operational capacity is such that we are not able to execute the Title 42 authority that rests with the Centers for Disease Control. I should also say that there is a convention against torture exception if someone claims uh, torture, which is a distinct legal standard. Individuals, as I mentioned, with acute vulnerability can be accepted uh, from the Title 42 application. Approximately 12,400 individuals will have their cases heard by an immigration judge to make a determination on whether they will be removed or permitted to remain in the United States. That is a uh, piece of data uh, that has been requested of us. If someone is not subject to Title 42 expulsion for the three reasons that I explained, acute vulnerability, operational capacity limitations, or a convention against torture exception, then the individual is placed in immigration proceedings. That means they go before an immigration judge in an immigration court. If they make a claim that they have a basis under law to remain in the United States, then the judge will hear and adjudicate that claim. If the judge determines that the claim is not valid, the individual will be removed. An estimated 8,000 migrants have decided to return to Mexico voluntarily. And just over 5,000 are being processed by DHS to determine whether they will be expelled or placed in immigration removal proceedings under Title VIII. We have previously uh, articulated publicly, we've previously expressed that in light of the fact that we had such a significant number of individuals in one particular section in Del Rio, Texas, that we were moving people to other Customs and Border Protection processing centers to ensure the safe and secure process processing of those individuals, and we will assess the ability to exercise the Title 42 Public Health Authority 
in those processing centers, and if any of the exceptions apply, uh, then we will place those individuals in immigration enforcement proceedings. But if we are able to expel them under Title 42, because that is indeed a public health imperative, as determined by the Centers for Disease Control, we will do so. And with that, uh, I'll take your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for coming in to take our course. Uh, the first question is, I was hoping you could explain more of your view that these agents on the border acted in a way that violated policies or procedures. Can you tell us what they did wrong to start? And my second question has to do with what this episode how this episode informs your, your understanding or thinking about the current and ongoing asylum review uh, and whether perhaps if uh, the administration were to take a more permissive stance to, toward asylum, membership in a particular social group, that this episode could be seen as one of many in the future. So I, I, I think if I may, uh, you're conflating two very different phenomena and two very different processes. Uh, first of all, uh, the images as I expressed uh, earlier. Uh, the images horrified us in terms of what they suggest and what they conjure up in terms of not only our nation's history, but unfortunately the fact that that page of history has not been turned entirely. And that means that there is much work to do and we are very focused on doing it. Uh, but I will not prejudge the facts. I do not in any way want to impair the integrity of the investigative process. We have uh, investigators who are looking at it independently. They will draw their conclusions according to their standard operating procedures, and then the results of that investigation will be, detect uh, will be determined by the facts that are adduced. Now, with respect to the asylum process, that has that is an independent process, and I'm not sure I understood your question. If you're asking about the definition of a particular social group, and just for everyone's benefit, um, uh, the asylum laws provide that an the first step in an asylum process is a claim of credible fear. Um, uh, economic need, um, flight from generalized violence does not qualify uh, as credible fear, but rather credible fear is credible fear of persecution by reason of one's membership in a particular social group. What is the definition of a particular social group was significantly constrained. Uh, that's an understatement uh, in the Trump administration. And there is a body of law that speaks to that definition. And that definition is currently under review. Mr. Secretary, if I may, forgive me for just the follow up on this point. Yes. The question was, if this administration were to take a more permissive stance toward that definition, could this be what we've just experienced in the last several weeks? just the first of many similar instances to occur in this country on the border. What instance are you referring well, to? Well, we, we have 15,000 migrants that the United States government has had to now uh, process. And, and, and so um, we determine, we determine uh, the standards to apply in a claim of persecution according to the principles that a government should have uh, both domestically and in the international architecture with the treatment of individuals who are fleeing persecution by reason of their membership in a particular social group. It is not a tool of deterrence to define what a particular social group means. Tam? Yeah, um, the, the people who, sorry, I'm here hiding behind a mask. <laughs> um, the, the people who were under the bridge, you've talked about uh, some of them have gone to Mexico, some of them have been flown to Haiti. Um, the others, are they spread out at CPB holding facilities? Or have some been released into the community or released to family members awaiting hearing? So you ask What's a very, so, so let, me, let me be clear. So uh, some have been returned uh, uh, to Haiti indeed. Others have been uh, moved uh, to different processing facilities along the border in light of operational capacity. And then um, many of them will be um, returned to Haiti from there. And if any of the exceptions apply, they will not be returned to Haiti but placed in immigration enforcement proceedings. I should say released is, is a very general term and I may need to drill down on that if I may. Individuals um, 
Some of uh, them are detained. Some of them are placed on alternatives to detention. We remain in touch with them. We monitor them to ensure their appearance in court at the designated time uh, of appearance. Does that answer your question? It does. And, uh, one other question. And, I, gave, and yeah. I provided the data if I need to, to do so again. Yes. No, I got that. The, um, the broader question is that it seems like there are border crises that keep popping up sort of like whack-a-mole every month or so. There's another clump of people or another major issue or, or unaccompanied minors. or And is there a plan to maybe have, um, you know, like FEMA type teams that go to these crisis points? Or um, is the goal to somehow stop having these crises that keep breaking out? Well, look, you, you mentioned uh, FEMA. So um, uh, two, two points, if I may. Let me first address the fun. Well, let me, let me go in reverse. From an operational response perspective, um, we address the challenge of unaccompanied children in March. And I said then that we had a plan, we were executing our plan, and it would take time. And in fact, within 60 days or so, we went from an average time of an unaccompanied child in a border patrol station of 124 hours to less than 25 hours. And we did that through our operational capacity throughout the Department of Homeland Security, as directed by the President in an all-of-government effort. Here, last weekend, we had approximately 15,000 individuals in the Del Rio section. I committed to addressing that within 10 days, and today we have none. And that was uh, uh, because of the, de the Department of Homeland Security's uh, assets with the assistance of others across the government. That is something very different than the, than the fact of the dynamism of irregular migration writ large and the fact that this is a situation that has occurred from time to time ever since I can remember in my more than 20 years of government service. And the President has spoken very powerfully about this from day one and before he assumed office. First and foremost and most fu fundamentally and foundationally, we are dealing with a broken immigration system and we need legislative reform. And everyone agrees. In a world where unanimity is so difficult to achieve, there is one thing that, as to which there is unanimity, and that is the need for comprehensive immigration reform. And unfortunately, it seems to remain elusive, but our, our real dedication to achieving it is um, unrelenting, and we continue to do so, number one. Number two, we have a three-part plan. Uh, we invest in the root causes uh, to address the need to address the reason why people leave the homes in which they live and take a perilous journey that they should not take. Second, the building of safe, orderly, and humane pathways. And third, rebuilding an asylum system and a refugee program that were dismantled in the prior administration. This takes time, and we are executing our plans. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and thank you for being here. I know we had suggested it'd be great to have you, so it's good to see you in the same week we made that request. Um, starting with the situation in Del Rio, the mounted units are temporarily suspended. Um, are you considering eliminating them altogether? So we're going to um, we're going to take a look. Um, what we were focused on right now is addressing the urgency of the situation in Del Rio under that bridge. Uh, we are still getting through it. Uh, remember, as I mentioned uh, in response to the prior question, we still have operational needs across the border with respect to this uh, particular population of individuals. But we're going to be taking uh, a look at this. What the horse patrol is customarily used uh, to do for uh, everyone's benefit is, you know, horses are able to cross terrain that might not otherwise uh, uh, be traversed. And what they often do and in fact, most often do is assess the situation and actually assist in helping people in distress. And uh, that horse patrol, the horse patrol that the Customs and Border Protection employs, the Border Patrol specifically, has actually saved lives many times before. And but we will take a look. And just on a, on, because yours is such a sprawling department, you face multiple issues at once. The situation regarding Afghan refugees that are being processed by your department. 
we've had a few questions on that that haven't entirely been uh, answered. I'm just curious if you know how many cases of forced marriage or so-called child brides has DHS found in the system so far? To my, to my knowledge, uh, we have not found one, but I will tell you that we have experts at the airport and uh, beyond who understand um, that phenomenon very, very well, who know how to detect the indicia, the signs of any such activity, and are able to place people in secondary screening, uh, discern the facts, and make the decisions uh, that the facts so warrant. We are very skilled in that. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I know you said you'd be looking into this, but the president was really clear today. He said those Border Patrol agents on horse vaccine and those images will pay. He said it's dangerous. He says it's wrong. And he said there will be consequences. So do you disagree with that? Oh, no. Um, I, I know the president was echoing the sentiments of the American public in response to the images and what those images suggest. But I want to speak to the fact that this in investigation will be based on the facts that the investigators um, learn and the results of the investigation will be driven by those facts and nothing less and but nothing the more. Said that they would pay, so you guys are not on the same page on that. I think the president was speaking in terms of the horror that he observed from seeing the images and what they suggest. So. That investigation will have integrity, I can assure you of that. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, I understand you guys have been saying since January 20th you inherited a broken system. There's a lot of work to be done here. But you have thousands of people living in squalid conditions, limited opportunities to uh, go through asylum processes here. Advocates have been warning about situations like this for months now. How much responsibility do you, does the administration, take for these situations continuing to kind of pop up in various places? Um, so, if you're um, if you're addressing the situation in Del Rio. I will tell you that uh, it is unprecedented for us to see that number of people arrive in one discrete point along the border in such a compacted period of time. That is unprecedented. We have the chief of the Border Patrol, Raul Ortiz, is, a, I think, a 30-year veteran, and he has not seen that before. And what we do when we see something that is unprecedented is we respond, and in respond, we did. Steve. So some Democrats have wanted you to be more lenient on the asylum claims because of the earthquake that Haiti went through. Have you considered that at all, sir? So uh, let me uh, let me speak uh, uh, to that. Um, we uh, studied uh, the conditions uh, in Haiti a number of months ago, as is our legal obligation to do so. And based on the country conditions that we uh, observed and studied, what we did is we um, uh, designated Haiti for temporary protected status for those Haitian nationals resident in the United States uh, who were here prior to July 29th. And we were mindful of the assassination uh, that occurred, and we were unsure of the results of that uh, assassination in terms of the stability of the political order. Once a, um, a new uh, leader uh, took office and things seemed to settle down, we determined that the July 29th date was equitable to address the humanitarian relief of Haitian nationals already resident in the United States. We have continued to study the conditions in Haiti, and we have in fact determined, despite the tragic and devastating earthquake, that Haiti is in fact capable of receiving individuals, and we are working with Haiti and with humanitarian relief agencies to ensure that their return is as safe and humanely accomplished as possible. I was around, I was at U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services on January 10th, 2010, the date of the last um, earthquake in Haiti, and that was distinct from the earthquake uh, that devastated uh, people more recently. That had a far greater geographic repercussions than this one now. This one, as devastating and tragic as it is, was more geographically limited, and we made a determination based on the legal standards and the facts uh, that, in fact, individuals could be returned to the country as a whole. Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, just to go back, please, uh, to the images of these mounted Border Patrol officers. You said on Saturday, or rather uh, on the 20th, to ensure control of the horse, long reins are used. The person who took these photos of the Border Patrol agents 
says, I've never seen them whip anyone. So why is the president out there today talking about people being strapped? So, so let me, let me, um, uh, let me correct uh, um, the statements in your question, if I may. It was on Friday. No, no, if, if, if I may. Um, uh, it was on Friday when I was, um, actually it was on Monday, I believe, um, when I was in Del Rio uh, on the ground. Uh, and I made the statements uh, without having seen the images. I saw the images on the flight back, and I made the statement that I did with respect to what those images suggested. Um, uh, there, the horses have long reins, and uh, the image in the photograph uh, that we all saw that horrified the nation raised serious questions about what. It, let me finish uh, about what occurred. And of, as I stated quite clearly, it conjured up images of what has occurred in the past. Let me, let me finish. Uh, there is also a question of how one uses the horse and how one interacts with individuals with the horse. And so I'm going to let the investigation run its course. I'm not going to interfere with that investigation. The facts will be determined by the investigators and then the results will be driven by the facts that are determined. And just to follow up, please, uh, before the facts are in, is it helpful to your investigation for the President of the United States to use inflammatory language like people being strapped? Well, let me just be very clear and um, repeat what I've said. I am not concerned with respect to the integrity of the investigation. We know how to conduct an investigation with integrity. I served as 12 years as a federal prosecutor. There were a great deal of comments in many of the cases that I handled in the public sphere, and I know how to maintain the integrity of an investigation, and this investigation will have integrity. Mr. Secretary, thank you. Our Title 42, our Title 42 expulsion, sending Haitians back to danger in Haiti, immoral. Yes or no? Uh, no, they are not. They are driven by a public health imperative. I understand the public health imperative, but, 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 but are they immoral? But let me, let, let me explain, because let me be quite clear. Uh, we do not conduct ourselves in an immoral way. We do not conduct ourselves in an unethical way. In fact, in fact, we are restoring people by reason of the immorality of the past administration. We are reuniting families uh, that were separated. Let me explain something, the reality of the situation, because we're dealing with a great number of individuals who are encountered at the border in a congregant setting and placed in customs and border protection, you know, border patrol stations. And that can cause the significant spread of a pandemic. And it is in light of the operational realities that the Centers for Disease Control made a determination in its public health expertise that Title 42 authority must be exercised. It is a statutory authority. And they made the determination that the public health of the migrants themselves, our personnel, local communities, and the American public require it. And that is why we are exercising that authority to serve the public health. Over 600,000 Americans have died. More than 40 U.S. Customs and Border Protection personnel have died. Many migrants have gotten sick. We are doing this out of a public health need. It is not an immigration policy. It is not an immigration policy that we would embrace. Congregation Sorry. under the bridge been congregating there, just mentioning COVID. What is the situation there? I know that the crowd has been dispersed. Do we know who has tested positive, if people got sick, any kind of symptoms uh, among this group of 15,000, you said? Uh, yes, so uh, we did not. We do not uh, test. We did not test that population of individuals. Uh, we do not know. I do not know. I should say, if I may be perfectly accurate, I do not know whether anyone was sick with COVID. We certainly had some individuals get sick, uh, not specifically uh, with COVID, to my knowledge, and we addressed their illnesses. Uh, in fact, we set up medical tents uh, that had a certain standard. Uh, of ability to address medical needs. It is, it was, it's hot 
in Del Rio, Texas. We had cases of dehydration. Uh, we had other situations, and that is precisely why we searched 100, approximately 150 medical professionals to address the medical needs of that population. That is why we set up uh, medical facilities uh, with the appropriate equipment to address their medical needs. And I must say, uh, what I saw of the Border Patrol and other personnel was, quite frankly, heroic. Uh, they took, this is not uh, their, uh, their customary um, obligations, and yet they took great pride in addressing the needs of the people. With all due respect, sir, the, your statement that this is not who we are belies the actual treatment of Haitian um, immigrants, not just in this administration, but in administrations of both parties going back decades. And um, you seem to be distinguishing between violence and violence. What is the difference between the type of violence that Haitians are fleeing in Haiti and the type of devastation and, 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 and um, other devastation that they are fleeing uh, as compared to other uh, immigrants and asylum seekers? Democrats, left and right, up and down, um, have been talking about the violence that people have been fleeing Central um, uh, Central America and, and South America and um, the president even during his campaign talked about the fact that this created a need to create an, a pathway and, a, and an asylum system. This doesn't seem to be the case when it comes to the Haitian uh, oh, immigrants. Uh, it, it, and in fact the images are a true graphic representation of the way Haitian uh, immigrants and, uh, and immigrants of African descent have been treated not just by this administration, but if, if I may, I would respectfully disagree uh, with you. And let me let me uh, say, U.S. immigration for the last twenty years, so I have some experience with it. Oh no, no, no I, I I wasn't commenting on your personal experience, sir. And I am a, a, an immigrant as well. Um, I wasn't commenting on your personal experience. I was respectfully disagreeing with an assertion that you made, if I may. Because, no, if, if, if I may, um, an asylum uh, claim is determined based on the facts that are presented in the individual case. Um, in fact, uh, the Title 42 authority has been applied to um, irregular migration since the very uh, beginning of this administration and before. And it has applied to individuals from Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and other countries. Um, it has been applied equally. And the exceptions that I cited have been the exceptions that have applied to all. There are three exceptions. The Convention Against Torture, acute vulnerabilities such as extreme um, medical uh, needs, and operational uh, capacity. Those are the three exceptions. Title 42 authority has been applied irrespective of the country of origin, irrespective of the race of the individual, irrespective of other uh, criteria that don't belong in our adjudicative process and we do not permit in our adjudicative process. Thank you, uh, the whipping, the, the whips, the horse whips. Sir, not that, is something, that is something that horrified us all. And you know, this morning I was on radio and um, the interviewer uh, said that it was, uh, it troubled uh, very profoundly the black and the African American community. And I, I, I said one thing, and, and it, this should be clear. Those are not the only communities that it, um, it horrified. Those are not the only communities uh, that it concerned. Of course, that concern might be most acute uh, given uh, the history uh, in this country and in other parts uh, of the world. But all of America is horrified to see what those images suggest. Thank you so much, Secretary Mayorkas. Appreciate your time. He'll come back, I promise. I know there's lots of questions, but we have to let him go back to his job. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Secretary Mayorkas. <laughs> You're always invited. Open invitation.